if you are anywhere in the pet community on social media, there is a good chance you have at least heard about raw feeding for dogs, maybe for cats as well. And when you start going down that rabbit hole, whether you are just learning about raw feeding or even if you have been doing it for a long time, but you're still in the social media like sphere of people talking about raw feeding, you're, you're going you're gonna to know right off the bat, there is a lot of confusion. A lot of people saying a lot of different things. No, you have to do it this way. No, you have to do it this way. Well, this is the way that I learned how to do it. And so this is the way you should be doing it. There is a lot of that going on. And it really can be very, very overwhelming. And sadly, can kind of make people turn away from feeding real food to their dogs at all, which is not what we want, right? So one thing that I have found that regardless of what it is you are wanting to learn more about, dive into, you just have this like, aha moment in your brain and you're like, I need to explore this more. What can you do to be more confident at it, to feel like you've got this and you can just five, four, three, two, one, go right into whatever it is. Today, we're talking about raw feeding, but it could be anything that is learning more about like diving in and really educating yourself about the topic. Now, this can in the past for raw feeding dogs has been a little bit difficult because the information is everywhere and it is all over the board and you're going to be able to find a lot of contradictory information as well. So what I have for you on today's podcast episode is going to blow your mind if you are one of these people that is just like, why is this so complicated? Because it doesn't have to be. It does not have to be complicated. So on today's episode, we're talking to Kay from Real Dog Box. She's actually heading the Feed Real Institute, which is a subsidiary of Real Dog Box. They are providing incredible education to pet parents and veterinary professionals. And Kay is going to be talking to you today about exactly what happened, why they put this program in place, and what you can expect to learn. They have an incredible pet parent program where you can go. It's an education program. You can go in and learn all the ins and outs about raw feeding your dog. It is incredible incredibly comprehensive, but also easy to manage and understand, which I think is the defining factor in action, right? Even people who have been feeding their pets a whole food diet for 10 plus years have taken this course and said, wow, this is incredible. I learned so much. So without any further ado, let's get into today's episode with Kay from Feed Real Institute. And just a heads up, this is canine nutrition. We are not talking about feline nutrition today. I did ask her about that, and hopefully it's something that they will expand to later on, and we'll talk more about in future episodes, but today we're focusing on canine nutrition. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, Kay, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I, I'm so interested in learning more about you and your story and the Feed Real Institute. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I became a vet tech 40 years ago. <laughs> um, I graduated from the fifth class um, out of Purdue in 1982. So it was still a really new career. Um, I worked in small animal practice for a couple of years and it was a, a little rural practice and, you know, we did vaccines and we did heartworm checks and it, I got bored very, very quickly. So the local university 
where I was living in uh, Northern Indiana was just opening animal research facilities. Never thought I'd work research, but I applied for the position and started as a vet tech and ultimately was their associate director um, of two animal facilities at the University of Notre Dame for 32 years. Um, And during that time, I was exposed to a lot of different animals, but dogs really wasn't a part of it. We had dogs here and there, um, but mainly for research on heartworm um, because we were seeing a reemergence in the area with different mosquitoes. So they were really just, they were really talking about the mosquitoes or, or researching the mosquitoes, but they had to have dogs there too. So I didn't have a lot of dog exposure except my own. Um, that job abruptly ended in 2017 because they reconfigured all of their departments and decided that middle management wasn't part of their paradigm anymore. So after 32 years, <laughs> I lost my job <laughs> um, and didn't really know what I was going to do. So I kind of floundered, um, got into the human medicine world in 2019. Bad mistake. <laughs> uh, so I worked in urgent care from 2019 to 2022 all during the height of COVID. And it was, it was terrible. It was terrible. Um, humanity had <laughs> really changed. Uh, and I had, had to get out. Yes. Um, and so I found this job at Real Dog Box. Uh, they wanted a remote writer for their website. Well, I was really missing academia. Um, and one of the benefits of leaving Notre Dame when I did, I was considered retirement age. And so I was able to retire, which meant I retained all of my, my email and my access to their libraries and all that kind of thing. So that's been extremely beneficial, um, doing all this research because I can pretty much find anything that, you know, you'll be on the net and I'll say, you know, pay $50 to read this article. Um, I can find those articles. And so it's been great. And I've used that and and really dug into all the information that I've used then to create the course um, at Feed Real Institute for the Real Dog Box. And that's where I am now, is just constantly researching, writing, and teaching about what we're doing. Well, that sounds like the perfect job. (laughs) (laughs) It has been um, wonderful because it's fully remote. So I was able to move down um, into Tennessee where my daughters and grandkids are. Um, So that's been awesome. I'm, I have an office right here in the house where the grandkids live. And um, so it's been, yeah, it's been great. And then we have, um, then we have um, a lot of, we bring a lot of travel because we're taking our information on the road to all the veterinary conferences um, so I guess I'm living the dream right now. <laughs> wow. That is quite a career. How interesting. I don't know that I've actually ever met anyone who did research like that. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. I've read tons of research, but like to meet someone involved mm-hmm. in it, I feel like, I don't know. I, I think my, my skin is too thin <laughs> to do something like that. It was, it was very difficult. Um, <laughs> We mainly use mice, rats, and fish, and so it's a little harder to get attached. Um, but yeah, it was it was very difficult, and it, it really wasn't aligned with what I needed, um, and it really it really did affect me. Um, getting out of that was the best thing that could have happened to me, and I I feel like I reclaimed my soul, <laughs> uh, and I I liked being okay. involved in some of it. You know, it was. I love the science. I love researching, but it's, it's a double-edged sword when you're using animals and, and it was hard. And, um, I must say, I'm glad to be out of it. (laughs) Yeah. I actually, if you don't mind, have a quick story for our listeners. I, and, and the reason that I'm, I'm telling this story is because I think it can put a little bit of perspective in people's minds and something that made a huge impact Mm -hmm. on me. Um, giving me perspective. So um, for my longtime listeners, they know that I do have a a bachelor's of science in psychology. And as part of that, I had to go through a lot of understanding scientific Mm -hmm. process and and how to set up research studies, blah, blah, blah. And of course, we're all, I mean, so many of us are animal lovers. And 
my teacher told us at one point, he said, everybody close your eyes. So if you're listening to this, if, as long as you're not driving, <laughs> close your eyes. <laughs> and um, he said, if you are 100, you know, if you, in your heart, you're just like absolutely completely against research on animals, raise your hand. And probably everyone in the class mm -hmm. raised their hand. I don't know. My right, eyes right. were closed. <laughs> And then he said, okay, put your hands down. And he said, think of somebody very, very, very close to you, your mother, your father, or your brother, your sister, um, your grandparent even, and they need, you know, they're, they're, they're going to die. They need this mm -hmm. drug, whatever X, Y, Z drug. And it is the only thing that is going to save them. But the only way to get that drug is that it has to be tested on a rabbit or a dog first. Would you test it on a rabbit or mm -hmm. a dog first to get that drug to save your loved one? And he's like, okay, raise your hands. And, um, you know, with your eyes closed, you don't know who's raising your hands. But at that time I was only about, I don't know, six years out from my father mm -hmm. passing away. So it was like very, uh, that's why I say like, it can be really impactful to really put perspective on, no, I don't want research <laughs> right. on animals, right? But at the same time, like putting that perspective Absolutely. on it. So I thought it was a good, I don't know, mm -hmm. story to interject for people because I know people listening to this podcast are very, you know, you know, their animal Absolutely. lovers are very like, no, why would you exactly. do that? <laughs> yeah, it is hard. And yeah. I, part of what I was able to um, keep myself there is that I was the voice for the animals. And so um, I ran the animal enrichment program and like every animal there, mouse to fish to whatever had some type of enrichment in their um, enclosure. And so, and then I was also the voice when it came to the, the um, actual procedures and the protocols and said, you know, this isn't working. We need to regroup, you know, um, we've had, we had a couple of studies that just had to be stopped and start back over, you know, like, I was the voice. So that's what I made me be able to sleep at night, but it was still very, very hard. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm relieved to be out of it. <laughs> so, yeah, goodness. That would take a toll. It does. Well, thank you for being there. Your voice <laughs> <laughs> while you were there at least. So uh, transitioning into, uh, you know, being a writer for real dog box and we'll, Mm -hmm. you know, talk about that in just a minute, you know, real, what real dog box mm -hmm. is for our listeners. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And the feed real mm -hmm. Institute. I'm interested to learn like, just like exactly what is mm -hmm. feed real Institute. Okay. Well, first of all, what I'd like to you know, introduce is that I had to make huge paradigm shifts. Um, I was trained as a classical, you know, vet tech. And so I was trained that kibble was what you fed your dog its entire life. I was trained that you give annual vaccines. I was trained that you spay neuter early. Um, I was involved in, uh, I actually had a charity for a spay neuter assistance program when I was in South Bend. Um, and it was for low income and it wasn't necessarily early spay neuter, but we helped get their dogs spayed neuter. Um, I was also part of a group that funded vaccines. And so I look back and I pulled out of, well, the spade neuter assistance program, we um, ended that charity and we put it into another one. But I stepped back from that charity because I'm like, I don't believe in all this anymore. Um, and I took a big hit as far as the friends that I had in that, that charity because they were really insulted that I backed away. Um, but that's okay. You know, I, I had that big paradigm shift. And then with the food, you know, it was... It was one of those moments that I think, why did I wait so long to understand this? I, it was really an odd feeling. Um, and so I, I learned so much. And so when I took on the job, um, basically it started just creating content for the Feed Real page. So the Feed Real Institute is the educational side of Real Dog Box. Real Dog Box is a monthly um, subscription box that you can get for your dog, your dog, and you have options of treats and chews, um, and a combination of those. And so we were doing a really good job getting people easy ways to put good products or good, good food into their dog's dish. Um, but we weren't educating them as to why. So that's why Ruby and Turk said, we need to educate people. 
and they created the feed reel side. And so when I started, it was just to create content. And then we're like, we're putting so much content together. Let's go ahead and create a course. Um, and we were creating one course that we were hoping to introduce to both veterinary personnel and to the dog parent. But it became apparent that in order for it to work, we had to, to go in two different directions. Um, because with the scientific side of it that you want for the veterinary professional, I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to get race certification on this so they can get continuing education. So there's some different guidelines. I can't put in that. I can't really promote real dog box in that content because it's for race credits. Um, so I said, we, we need to have two different paths. So then we're like, okay, let's regroup <laughs> and start going in two different directions. Um, at that time we did have a second writer, but, um, she left the, the organization, I'm trying to think in September. So then it's just been me. Um, so we got the concentrated on the dog parent one and got that out. Um, and then I, I finished the professional one, but we're still in the process of getting the race certification. Um, hoping that that finalizes we're hoping by the end of this month where I think we're still going to release it in March um, and anybody taking it as long as they don't finish it before they're pending uh, race credit, we think it still get the credit. So we're, we're playing. Should, should we wait till April? You know, we're, we're so close <laughs> because the course is ready. We just we're really wanting to get that recertification. So. Awesome. Yeah, there's so I've heard so many good things about the pet mm -hmm. parent one um, from other people that I'm friends with and follow on, on social mm -hmm. media that like even people that, you know, have been doing this for many, 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 many years are like, I learned something and it was that was really cool yes. to hear. It was really great for me to hear because <laughs> I'm, you know, not even two years into this journey. So um, to know that I can help people that have been in it a long time is, is great. I know my writing and research skills are there. Um, and I'm, you know, in this journey early on, I didn't have a dog for the first, well, I just moved into a situation where I have a dog that's not mine, but I have converted her over mainly to raw. Um, and so I'm still, you know, really learning in this journey too. And I love to hear that, that the course is helping people. Um, I think the biggest aspect of the course is the practicality. So when I taught at the university level, I um, taught pre-vet students. So students, any student wanting to go on to vet school would, would come through my office. And I was their advisor. And I taught a couple of different classes. And my goal was to teach how to apply knowledge. So yes, you need to learn this knowledge but tell me how to apply it. Don't spit it back to me. And so that's how I go about the course is try to develop it so that it's knowledge that you can use, not just memorize. And obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you're not having to memorize it for a passing grade, that kind of thing. Yes, you have to, if you're taking the course, you have to pass the quizzes, but it's a different feeling. It's not just, you know, spitting back out the information. Um, but we have a lot of practical tips. Like so many of the articles are, this is how to do it. Um, how to transition. This is how you can add to kibble if you can't go completely raw. This is what you can do to help the dog. This is what you can do at all the different life stages of the dog. Um, and so we really put practicality in there. And that was, I think, that's what sets us aside from so many other uh, courses, is that you, you're you learning a ton, but you're also learning how to apply it. And that's my goal always. Well, yeah, because especially for, you know, the average pet parent, information is great, but, you know, inf information overload especially can be um, very overwhelming mm -hmm. and kind of debilitating. <laughs> so really learning how to use right. the information is probably the, the key to getting people to mm -hmm. act, to, you know, to actually change their behavior and, and, um, move forward to help to help their pet because overwhelm can be really difficult. It can be. And I think, um, so then there's the workshops that we offer. I don't know if you're familiar with those. So okay. it's a do it yourself, um, creating a diet or, you know, a, a meals for your dog. Um, and we do them live virtually every month. And during that workshop, as you sign up for it, you go to the feed reel 
calculator, feedreel.com um, backslash calculator and put in your dog's information and it spits out what you need to have for the um, workshop unit. We tell you to get seven days worth of food. And during the workshop, we explain what you're doing. It's all hands-on. So we really recommend that after the course. Um, with the professional course, it's yeah. part of it. They have to take the hands-on. They have to learn that before they get their certificate. Because we felt that was really important. If you're using this as a career stepping stone or you're getting um, continuing education, education credits, you need to have that component too. So... With the pet parent, it's an option afterward or before or during. I mean, it doesn't matter when you sign up for it, but we recommend after. Um, but with the professional course, it'll be required. And during that hands-on, yeah, we, awesome. we go through all the different aspects, the components of what you're putting in the bowl, why you're putting that component in the bowl, um, how to measure it, um, how to monitor your dog to see if the right amount of bone is in there. We talk about poop and what it means and what it looks like and all that, that kind of thing. And um, we've had really great reviews on that. So that's been a lot of fun to work with um, our customers, you know, face to face, even though it's virtual. That, that is interesting. And um, I, I appreciate that so much. I, I remember back to when I started first feeding my dogs a home cooked diet and I had no <laughs> idea what I was doing. And, um, I took took what I was doing to my vet at the time and I said, how can I make this better? How can I make sure I'm giving them what they need? And at my vet at the time was like, I don't know, it looks good to me. Maybe add some tomatoes. <laughs> and I was like, I went home and that was like my light bulb moment that they don't no. know what they're doing no. either. <laughs> no, and, and you know, to right? to their defense, you know, they have to learn so much in that four years of vet school and none of the vet schools really emphasize nutrition other than feeding kibble. Um, they're sponsored by big kibble companies. Most of the vet schools are offered, uh, they offer their vet students free cat and dog food, which from whichever kibble company, you know, so they get really used to that kibble and that's what they're going to recommend. Um, and so it's really hard. And, you know, in, in these, Kibble companies make it sound like if you don't recommend kibble, you can be sued for not, you know, giving them the proper nutrition. And, and, and so there, I think there's a lot of veterinarians that are interested in it, um, especially after talking to them at conferences, but they're a little scared. Um, they're afraid that they're going to give bad advice. They're afraid that the uh, um, clients will get bacterial in infections, you know, problems with contamination and they're afraid of imbalances. And so we address all of that in the course um, all the way through. Plus at the end, we actually have like debunking myth kind of articles and say, this is, this is what's really going on with the bacterial contamination. This is mm -hmm. what's really going on with um, imbalances and how, you know, having a great variety in what you're feeding is going to prevent those imbalances. Your the variety of foods are going to bridge any gaps. And then we also talk about supplementing with purpose. You don't just automatically give a supplement. You, there's a reason like itchy skin. Okay. Then you give specific supplements, whole food supplements for that, not a pill out of a bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, those are the practical things that we go into. That makes a huge difference for me saying that you're not recommending, especially like mm -hmm. pills out of a bottle of supplements. Cause I am that person that if I can accomplish what I need to accomplish with whole foods. Why am I supplement? Why would I ever buy a supplement in a bottle? And not that there aren't uses for them, but the, you know, that I think we're seeing like it's, it's becoming trendy now and there are so many out there. So many. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, and you know, I think even the veterinarians who are diehard, you know, feed kibble, feed kibble, feed kibble. I think they're going to be um, confronted a little bit harder mm -hmm. here very soon. Mm -hmm. Two reasons just this year in 2023 I have seen is one, of course, the big one, like, you know, of course, the, that one veterinarian <laughs> rant over the fresh yes. food commercial in the Super Bowl, right? And how everybody was like picking it apart and like, you don't even know what you're mm -hmm. talking about here. <laughs> like the things she was saying. Yeah, exactly. True. And yeah. And then um, 
the second one, and you're probably familiar with this too, but like uh, Susan Thixton, Steve Brown, and I think Karen Becker are looking at and, and uh, I think even getting data over to the FDA about, you know, what, what is on this bag of food and what AFCO standards are and like what people are being told to actually feed their pets. They're actually not, it's not actually right. not balanced, <laughs> especially the, you know, when your, your veterinarian is like, Oh, well, you know, your pet's overweight. So feed less than what the bag mm. says to feed, or you have a high activity dog and they're not getting enough nutrients mm -hmm. when you're, you know, or, or you feed them <coughs> double and then maybe there's potential for like copper right, toxicity right. or something, you know, because you're feeding them double. So there's, there's a lot to unpack in there. And I think, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of head, head butting soon. Well, and I think that's <laughs> why timing of this course is, is good because and that's what we talked to the veterinarians about is that we understand your concerns. <clears throat> we understand that, especially the imbalances that they could create, because yes, if your clients are just feeding chicken and rice, you're right. They're going to have imbalances. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that is what we address. We address all of that and how, why it is so crucial to feed this combination and having um, different proteins added in, you know, a lot of variety, a lot of variety and all of your different components so that you don't create imbalances. Do we try to meet those APCO requirements? Absolutely not. Because in our case, the whole food is so much more bioavailable you don't know that you don't know. They don't know how much is getting absorbed. Um, and, you know, but there's been a lot of studies mm -hmm. about synthetic vitamins and minerals and how the body reacts to them. And the body doesn't know what to do with those. Yeah. They link to the receptors and they just kind of sit there and they block the receptors for the real vitamins and minerals. So then you can cause imbalances with that. So we really try to unpack that as, as you put it and try and, and show people why, whole food supplementation is so much better and, and with a purpose, you don't, you know, you see all these pretty bowls on Instagram and, and Facebook and, and, you know, they're just throwing in all these pretty things because the bowl looks pretty, but that's not with a purpose. Um, like a really good purpose would be during flea and tick season. Then you add a little bit of garlic in their food to keep the fleas and ticks off of them. That's supplementing with the purpose. That's supplementing for a reason. Um, your dog's getting a little bit um, arthritic due to age. Then you start giving them gl more glucosamine and, and um, chondritin with whole food supplements like chicken feet and tracheas. And, you know, I mean, things that have that cartilage in there that they're going to get that from. I want to pivot really mm -hmm. quickly, uh, if you don't mind, because I, on my journey... And, you know, my longtime listeners will, will know, like I, I have, I started working with cats. I transitioned to working with dogs as, you know, a positive reinforcement dog trainer. And I've been transitioning into health coaching because I found with the dogs that I was training, changing their diet, adding fresh foods into their diet, mm. makes such a huge difference in behavior. And because you are, you seem to be the person <laughs> to ask about it. <laughs> I know, you know, I just in, in this back here somewhere, Dr. Mm -hmm. Connor Brady's book, Feeding Dogs, like he really mm -hmm. focuses on that and in one part as well. Like, I'm not making this <laughs> up, right? Like, this is real. It's very real. <laughs> um, and that's because of the gut microbiome. Um, if the gut isn't getting what it needs, then the bacteria cannot produce the hormones that we need. I was really, this was one of my aha moments when I was doing all of this. Um, I had a lot of them, <laughs> but this was one of my early on <laughs> is that 90% of the serotonin in your body is produced in the gut. I just always assumed it was a brain thing, you know, cause that's what they talk about. Um, and so, yes, if the gut microbiome is off and the serotonin is not being produced and the dopamine is not being produced and the acetylcholine and, and, GABA, which I don't remember exactly how to say everything that's with, and norepinephrine, those five things are part of the gut. And so if the gut is not happy, you're not getting happy hormones to create a happy dog. Um, so that's, that is huge. And I've heard the same thing. I'm not a dog trainer, um, but I do know some, and they've said the same thing. Like one of the first things they'll ask is what are you feeding this dog, especially these really reactive dogs. And let's try a raw diet. 
um, do a animal biome, you know, fecal test, see what their microbiome is looking like and go from there. I mean, if that gut biome is not happy, you're going to have a reactive dog. So I think that you're right on track. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have I have had many hyperactive, reactive, whatever, any and and everything Mm -hmm. in between, even dogs that are just like, I just can't get them like they're good. I just can't get them to listen to me when I want Mm -hmm. them to listen to me, you know, like, yeah, it's it's all around has helped everybody. Um, What was I getting (laughs) ready to say? (laughs) Thank goodness I can edit. Um, yeah, the, oh, so I, I'm glad you brought up the animal biome gut health test because, so my dog mm-hmm. just turned nine. And one of the things I did was to even, I thought everything was fine. You know, ever since we, the day we have adopted her, she has been raw fed. Um, I really, we really mm-hmm. knock on wood have not had any real issues with her. Um, so, but I just decided, you know what, I'm going to mm-hmm. do the gut health test. I want to see where she is, make sure everything's okay. She's getting into her senior years, blah, blah, blah. And the test showed me that she was not getting enough fiber. And um, what I found in talking to Billy Hokeman is that that is something animal biome is finding that raw fed dogs specifically, mm. they're just not getting enough fiber. And my dog, in, as mm-hmm. an individual, she does not like okay. eating vegetables. I buy her commercial raw food. So there mm-hmm. it's a grind and there are veggies in it. And what I have had to do is I've been buying green juju. I could make it myself, <laughs> but I've been buying green juju and getting their, their veggie mixes okay. and mixing it into the grind so that she can't pick it out. But are you, I, I'm assuming that is also mm-hmm. something that you talk about that we do in the course is getting mm-hmm. at what we, fiber. Because that is actually a big source of like contention in the raw right. feeding world, right? Some people are like absolutely no vegetables, and others are like, yeah, veggies are. Well, great. and we address that in, in a to to look at both sides. So if you don't believe in the vegetables, fur and feathers are a great way to get that fiber. So we always have fur on um, treats and chews it in our box every month. There's something that has fur, um, and that way they're still getting the fiber and you know feathers are another one. They would eat those in the wild, not a ton of it, but they would eat some. Um, I know the dog that I am um, helping with, she loves rabbit feet, the little air dried rabbit feet that we get um, in my boxes and the cow ears with all the fur, which most people are like, oh, my dog won't touch that. They love it. And that that fur will act as the fiber. So if your dog doesn't want vegetables, um, the way you're doing it is great. Um, or you can give fresh and, and grind them up or, you know, however you can get them in there. But yes, we say 5% of the diet should be some type of fiber, either vegetables and fruit or fur and feathers or a combination thereof. Yeah, that's what we recommend. I've been adding the mm-hmm. fermented mm-hmm. beets to add digestive enzymes so I don't have to supplement digestive enzymes. Cause like I said earlier, I don't want to, I don't want to add right. supplements right. if I don't have mm-hmm. to, <laughs> but, um, yeah, my plan is to give this, uh, probably 60 days mm-hmm. and retest to nice. see where we're at to make sure that, um, you know, what I'm doing is making a difference and it's making sure. a positive difference. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad that you are addressing that mm-hmm. in the course, because I know it is a big, like people right, butt heads right. over this. And exactly. And like, so we, we address it as 5% for, or, or other fiber. So I personally give yeah, the dog, awesome. um, the fur because she doesn't like, she'll eat carrots, yes. um, you know, a little bit here and there, mm-hmm. but she doesn't really like the rest of it. And I haven't tried that much. I haven't tried like the green juju or anything with her because she loves the furred items. So I'm like, okay, we're going to give you a fur. Yeah. I, my dog is still a little bit picky about the green juju, but one of the reasons that I like it is because it, they will also use some sort of mm-hmm. bone broth in it to probably just give it a little bit more of a, you know, right, right. flavor that a dog would <laughs> exactly. actually want to eat. <laughs> Bone broth is so good for so many things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So 
the, I thank you so much for bringing all of this information. I'm very interested in the course. Um, and, and I did know that about the uh, monthly, like getting together, putting the meals together. I didn't realize they mm -hmm. did it virtually. So that's good to know. I thought they we did, did it, do it in um, person in up until I think October mm -hmm. is when we did our first virtual. Um, they're not even doing them in person anymore because the virtual ones are, are working so well. Um, so oh, yeah, right. once a month, I know our next one's the 11th of March. And then I think the 15th of April is going to be our April one. Um, I think the March one, we might have one or two spots left. We try to keep it at eight um, people so that we can address everybody's concerns. We always have somebody right now, Ruby's mm -hmm. doing the actual train or talking and, and the cutting and all that while we go through. And I'm there taking notes and, and writing down what we, what articles we need to send people that they had specific questions. So each of the um, workshops is different. It all depends on who joins us and what, where they're at in their journey. We answer so many questions and we can tailor it specifically like, you know, like my dog that I'm working with, she will not eat raw chicken feet. But if I boil them for three minutes, it's enough to bring that out. And they're still raw, but it's enough for her to accept them. And the same with some of the other um, organs. So yeah, oh, that's I just, cook them just barely. So those are the kind of tips that we give you specifically as you're creating this and, and we're talking to you and, you know, or we couldn't, you couldn't find specific things. You know, we, we send you out to find everything that you need, um, which is a great exercise in and of itself. Cause you may have to hit three or four different markets to get that and depending on where you live. And then we can also talk about what real dog box has. Like I am getting the organ grind mix from here on out because <laughs> Kona doesn't really like the raw yeah. organs and it, it's the raw, the, the organ mix is so easy. <laughs> it's like sprinkling salt and pepper on their food you know, yeah. kind of thing. Um, so that's a new product that we yeah. have just added. They can add on to your subscription box and it's great because it always has liver and then it has another secreting organ and you've got that taken care of. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ways for us to help you. There's ways that we can talk you through on those workshops. I've learned so much helping with the workshops and, and really, really enjoy. I'm going to be taking them over. I think April's going to be my first one that I actually do the whole thing. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's awesome to see how far it's come. I don't, I, I think I mentioned in an email to you, I used to live in San Diego. So this is mm -hmm. like seven, eight years ago. I used to do the, uh -huh. the pack walks with Ruby and Turk and, um, it's awesome to see. Yes. Them yes. Oh. And they just keep growing and it's, I've so enjoyed working with them and, and appreciate their vision because they, they just keep seeing, you know, forward, like the role that I have as an educator, I don't know of any other company that has a full-time educator like I am for, you know, working for them. And I love writing and researching. I mean, that's, that's me, you know, and then to be able to share it on top of that, is the perfect fit. And so I just, I love their vision. I love working for them. Um, I've been out to the kitchen a couple of times and they put me on the line and I have to, you know, know what's going on and help pack and cut and dry, you know? And so I'm so impressed with our team and it's just, it's a great organization and I really am proud to be part of it. So Kay, where can people find all of this? There's a lot, <laughs> but where can people so of find course, Right. Yeah, the course, of course. The um, box, if everything. they go to feedreel.com slash course courses, the courses are all there. Or just go to feedreel.com and, and look at all the things that we offer, the workshops, the courses, the articles, um, everything is there. And then real.dog is where they can go in and find the subscription boxes and sign up for those. Um, and all of that's tailored to your dog too. You know, some dogs may have a true sensitivity to chicken. Just indicate that on your profile. You'll never get chicken mm -hmm. products. Um, some people are really not wanting to get bird items. It just is one of those things. You know, I don't want that. Okay, then we won't send you that. You know, very specific. Um, so all of that is very, very accessible. We have for members on the, the Real Dog Box subscription, those members can get onto what we call the secret shop. And those are items that we can't get enough of to get 
the whole subscription box group to get. So you jump on the secret shop and you get a text and people jump on as soon as that opens. And we usually sell out within 20 minutes of everything we have on there. <laughs> the organ mix used to just be on the That's secret incredible. shop. And now it's, it's, it's an item you can get on a regular basis. We were testing it to see how it worked. Oh, um, nice. So yeah, there's the secret shop is, is funny because even I will be like, oh, I'm going to be busy. I can't get on. <laughs> and I'll get on for our dog here. Um, and then I, we have a couple of cats here on um, on the property and we feed them a lot of like the organ mix and that kind of thing works for cats too. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I don't, I, I don't like to really buy things that I can't mm. give to both mm-hmm. my dog and my cat. Yeah. Generally. Yeah, so many of our subscription box members, so. um, say that their cats love the, a lot of the items, you know, and you assume, oh, they're going to love the fish because there's always fish in the box. There's always organ meat, fish, three different chews and muscle meat. Well, the cats love the muscle meat, the organ meat, the chews, you know, the, the lighter chews. Yeah. Um, no, it's not just the fish. <laughs> so it works out really well. No, it's not. Definitely. My, my cats are very, they love the organ meat and the all like you know, liver, mm-hmm. heart, all of it. Mm-hmm. They're they're down. <laughs> one of our cats loves everything. Um, the other one is so kibble addicted, and we're slowly trying to get him off of the kibble. Slowly, and he'll he'll he likes like fresh fish, like herring and sardines, that kind of thing. Um, he will eat a little bit of the organ meat, but mm-hmm. actual muscle meat, he won't. He won't even look at it. So, and again, that's yeah, that's. Wow. Yeah. That's why we have these workshops. That's why we have where you can uh, you can actually consult with our nutritionists too, as a member of um, the Real Dog Box. You get a monthly free sub- free consultation with the subscription, so you can really hone in on what it is that you need to change, or you just have questions or concerns. You can work with a nutritionist every month, and you can be assigned to one, so you get the same one every month. That's yes. an incredible value. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I did not yes. know that. So become that's a member awesome. of the Real Dog Box, <laughs> and that's one of your perks. Yes. Well, Kay, thank you so much You're for welcome. joining us. I normally end by telling everyone to give their pets some extra love, but do you have any <laughs> parting words for all of our pet parents and their um, pets? I think the biggest thing that I have found that um, don't shame yourself for not knowing this before. I mean, I was a vet tech for 38 years doing the kibble thing and um, it's really hard not to shame myself for it, but I know what I know now and I'm going forward with it and I'm doing the best I can. And, and don't shame kibble feeders either. Um, We really strive Mm -hmm. to make them help their dogs by adding extra things. Um, But we never judge or shame people for feeding kibble. We want them to understand we do understand and there are other ways that you can enhance what you're feeding. So those are kind of my parting words. Those are some really great ones. We were all, I, I, all, we were all kibble feeders once. I don't think I've talked to anybody in the pet space that was right, not once a right. kibble feeder. So <laughs> of course we, we have to give the each only other, other thing. <laughs> um, if you do go to my real dot dog slash K, you can get 10% off of all of the, um, the course or your, you know, for subscription box, you can get $10 off. So there are ways to get some discounts from today. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I will put all of that Perfect. in the show notes. Thank You're you welcome. so much for joining Thank us. You. Kay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the furry family coach. Just go to the furry and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's the furry family and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.